Father, we thank you and praise you. You are our God and King, and we truly are here to worship you today. Father, we ask you to just come and continue to inhabit the praises of your people. Would you anoint the words that I will speak, that they be your words and not mine, that we would have spiritual eyes to see and spiritual ears to hear what you want to speak to each of us today. And Lord, would you give us the power to put it into practice in our everyday lives in Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen. So. We're still in our freedom series. We're going to continue on next week with two messages, one week after another, that are going to be out the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. We've been talking about emptying ourselves out. We've been learning about all of these different things pertaining to stuff that could bind us and challenge us. And then we're going to move on to overcoming and getting filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. And you'll hear why by the conclusion of today's message. So today I want to talk about a subject that seems a little weird at first. I've entitled this message, Doors. It's not something you really think about all that much in life. Oftentimes, doors are routine. We take them for granted. When we wake up in the morning, as you did today, if you could find your keys, you were getting ready to leave the house, and you walked out the front door, and you probably locked it either with your physical keys or, as many of us do today, with our smart locks, or you plug in some, some kind of a code. How many of you use smart locks? I'm going I'm to hack some of those. In Jesus. No, I'm teasing. I use a smart lock as I get ready to walk out the house. Now you can find a cool. You can open it and close it with your app. We leave that one set of doors, leaving our dwelling place. Most of us walked up to our car where, yet again, we pulled out the keys or we used some kind of a smart fob or something so that we could get into there. You drove to the church, and at the church, hopefully when you walked up, the doors were actually flung wide open, welcoming you to come in, right? And you go to your workplace, and maybe it's the same way. Maybe it's already opened when you get there, or maybe you're one of the ones who uses the key to help get you inside. So it really begs the question, what are doors for? What are doors really for in life? Well, when I started to think about it, doors are really to prevent something from coming in, right? Or to protect something valuable that's inside, right? So some doors, as I said, are purely ornamental in nature and other ones are like vaults. And today what I really wanna talk about is spiritual doorways. The things that we do in our own life that have that same function and feature, right? The things that either we let in or the things that we need to protect in our spirits. It's very important. Before we get to the spiritual aspect, let's use just a couple more um, human analogies. So when we get to our human body, we are these triune beings that we've been talking about, right? We are spirit beings that have a soul that live in a body, right? So how do we get inputs? How do we begin to let things in in our lives? Well, we have different things like our mouths, right? So mouth is the gateway to food. If you eat good food over time, you stay healthy. If you eat junk food over time, you get sick, right? It kind of works out that way. Then God's given us these blessings of our noses, right? Our noses, they can actually help with the taste of your food, believe it or not, but also they elicit these emotions. So how many of you have been on that ride at Disney where it was like, soar, I think it was called soaring, right? And you're soaring through there and then you go over the orange field and all of a sudden they spray some orange smelling spray and it smells really, how many of you like oranges? You just smell the blossoms in the air right now. It's eliciting those beautiful feelings. Or contrary, you could smell that right poopy diaper in Jesus' name, right? Like some of you, I just took your emotions from up here to down here in a moment. Lord, help me forget about that. Think good things. Winter green, mountain breeze, ocean breeze in Jesus' name, right? So it can elicit all of these different emotions by the things that we take in through our nose. And then God's given us our ears, right? that we can hear with, that we can allow things to come in. And we need to begin to even ask our questions at this stage of what are you allowing in to pass by your ears? What are you listening to? What are your eyes allowing in? What are you viewing on a regular basis? Are they things that contribute to your spiritual health or are they things that detract from your spiritual health, right? And then finally, maybe the last input mechanism is touch, right? We have touch that we could do. So God has gifted us with these different doorways that can affect our spirits and our souls. And we have a job as Christians to control what comes in, 
what we allow in. There's times that we need to put up barriers to certain things coming in that are not of the Lord. And there's other times we need to open the doors up wide. Is all this making sense to you so far? So we need to protect what we allow to come through, especially in the spirit, our ears and eyes that result in actions and thoughts. I'm building on something here. So it's said that the eyes are the gateway to our souls. It says this in scripture, Matthew chapter six, verse 22. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, the whole body will be full of darkness. If the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? So now we're starting to get to these spiritual implications, which is where I really wanted to go. So one thing we need to realize in this life at a very practical sense is the things that we allow to happen physically often have spiritual ramifications. Does that make sense to you? The things that happen physically can transfer into our souls and ultimately into our spirits. Let's use an example here first. Let's start out with a bad one. Lust, where does it start? Why y'all being so quiet? Some of y'all know, right? Lust, where does it start? In our eyes. So then if we take that second glance, that glance turns into a stare. Left unchecked, that glance turns into a conversation, leads to the smell of perfume that leads to a touch, and now you're in a really deep place that you should have never been in Jesus' name, right? So we gotta control first what comes through our eyes. We have to protect what we allow through these different doorways in our life. Is it okay if I get all Pentecostal holiness movement on you for just a couple minutes? We'll go, we'll go just a little bit old school. You know, maybe their motives were right. Holiness is utmost important, is it not? You know, maybe they went about it not with grace, um, but with legalism. So let's use a little bit of grace to season it. But holiness really does matter. So let's turn our subject to something like Hollywood and television for a second. Asking ourselves the question again, particularly as believers, what are you allowing through your eyes and your ears when it comes to television, when it comes to YouTube, when it comes to the internet, when it comes to Netflix, when it comes to Amazon Prime, or wherever you today get your information that you're allowing in? Are you allowing in good things that'll help you grow? Is what we're watching biblical? Is it neutral or is it bad? Is it biblical, is it neutral, or is it bad? Who created it, and what was their motive or their agenda in doing so? Right now, what comes out of Hollywood and many of our big tech giants stands in direct opposition to the Word of God. It stands in direct, did you hear what I just said? Right now, what comes out of those places stands in direct opposition opposition to the Spirit of God, to what the Bible says, and is contrary to the Christian spirit, yet I think probably all of us are guilty of advising or looking at way more of it than we really should, absorbing way more of that kind of content than we really should. Can I get an amen? Even if it's like, I can't believe you just said that, that stinks, I gotta cancel Netflix now, oh my God, this is awful. Nobody's monitoring what you're watching here. But just look at this, I started to just think about it. A quick glance of the TV guide on any week would normalize some of the following. Adultery and sex out of marriage, almost every single show, right? Polygamy, The Bachelor, sorry, Bachelor, Bachelorette, polygamy. Homosexuality, transgenderism, substance abuse, violence, abortion, of late socialism, which almost always leads to communism at the end of it. But they, these things, this content stands oftentimes in direct opposition to the word of God. It is a propaganda machine at times of the devil, is it not? Yet we take it for granted. What we're allowing in Christianity today is the content and culture of the world to transform us. When in fact, what scripture tells us is that Christianity and the Bible should transform culture. 
that Jesus came and it looked like he turned the world upside down because things weren't all that different in his day than they are in our day. The ways in which we take in the content are different, but the sins remain the same. Jesus came to put the world right side up, not turn it upside down, right? So we got to think about these things. Maybe we don't think about them all that often, but they're deep, deep, deep spiritual connotations, especially when we're talking about this subject of freedom. If you want to be free and you're continually bombarding yourself with the content of the world, it's going to be a lot harder to be free. Would you agree, right? If you're continually allowing this onslaught in that affects us and affects the church, it's going to be a very difficult thing. The fact of the matter is almost all of us, including myself, are consuming way more of the world's content than we are biblical content on a weekly basis, and it shows in the strength of the faith of the church at times. Not just Journey Church, but the church. We more often than not conform to the image of the world rather than being the transforming agents that God has called us to be. One hour per week is not enough to offset the average screen time of four to six hours per day of worldly content. Think about that for a minute. How many of you got that new, I got the apple, I can't believe I went to the other side. Come on, Jesus, help me out. I mean, help me out here. But it has that screen time app. How many of you look at that screen time? I was like, "Uh uh-oh, right? Think about that. The average American consumes four to six hours of screen time, mostly of worldly content, and we wonder why at times the church just doesn't thrive to overcoming. We need to change some of these things and maybe get a grip on what we're allowing through our eyes and into our ears because it's causing us oftentimes to look a lot more like the world than we ever dare want to look like, amen? So it does get much deeper spiritually. I told you this was gonna be a very spiritual message. There's a huge difference in the way that the devil operates and the way in which Jesus operates. John 10, seven begins to bring out some of this contrast. It says, Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go out and find good pasture. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly. So for us as believers, Jesus is the ultimate gatekeeper. He's the ultimate door. If we side with him, if we go where he wants us to go, he will lead us into green pastures. He will take care of us. He will protect us. He will love on us. He will care for us. He will be there for you. He will never leave you or forsake you. You can trust in what he has to say in a world where seemingly there is so little trust, right? And the opposite end described the thief who comes but to steal, kill, and destroy, right? He comes to try to take us out. We brought this up at the very beginning of this year and the very beginning of this series. He is cunning, baffling, and powerful. And without this kind of knowledge, without the infilling of the Holy Spirit, he is too much for us. He is way smarter than any of us are, even most of us combined. But guess what? We have something that we can overcome with. Jesus is the door. Aren't you glad you got a big, strong door there to help protect you? Now, if you go opening it up on your own all the time, guess what? You're heading for some trouble, right? That's where I'm starting to go. What doors are you opening up? Where are you kicking Jesus out and leaving a little bit of hole in there for the devil to get in? Because he will exploit every weakness. For a while, Mary Jo and I had some goats on the farm, right? Goats are of the devil in Jesus' name. You see why they describe them different than sheep in the Bible, right? A goat will escape anything. They said if a drop of water can get out, the goat can escape. I'm telling you, I put up fence, and then I put up more fence, and then more fence, and then guess what? It still was over there eating my neighbor's roses. I'm like, oh, Jesus, you going. You lucky I don't eat goat because you be gone, you know? But uh, I'm telling you, it would escape, man. And 
we just got to be careful because sometimes we're like that goat. We got this great protective barrier that God's put up all for us. And then rather than embracing it and living in that place that God wants us to, we stray outside of that gate. We stray outside of that door. And then we find ourselves in a heap of trouble. Can I get one more amen as challenging as that might be? So like thieves in the natural The devil uses a variety of ways to get past the locks on your door. Sometimes he picks it subtly. You don't even know he's doing it. Deceiving us little by little through the stuff that we're taking in through our eyes and our ears. Other times he'll just come and kick down the door. Let's go back to our lust analogy. It's okay to have sex out of marriage. It feels good. It's not a problem. And then somehow the devil tricks us into opening the doors, right? Many have fallen into that trap, would you agree? It happens over and over and over again. So they desensitize us through this content. We deem it to be acceptable. We begin to believe the lie. It gets from an input into our hearts and minds into taking root in our hearts and minds. We allow that behavior to become acceptable when it's nothing that is acceptable at all, right? Culturally, there's a war on it for your children right now as well. You think all this content that they're pushing out there to say that all these things is acceptable is of the Lord or a scheme of the devil to knock down those doors in their life. We gotta protect our children as well from the content that we allow in. What are they watching on their phones when you're not around, right? We need to be cautious of these things because there's deep, deep, deep spiritual implications. Other times, the devil knows that the doors are weak. He simply kicks them in and overtakes. So our first offense, Jesus, his word, the Bible, our prayer life, our devotional life, all add strength to our doors to make them like a safe that the devil cannot kick in. We as believers must maintain a fit spiritual condition to have strong doors to prevent the strong man from coming into our lives from the outside to overtake us. Jesus says this in Luke 11, 20, as we go deeper down this rabbit trail. But if it is the finger of God that I use to cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own palace, the goods are safe. But when one is stronger than him and attacks and overcomes him, he takes away his armor in which he trusted and divides the spoil. He describes really two different state of minds. I could relate it back to my own drug addiction experience, right? They said, my sobriety is contingent upon me maintaining a fit spiritual condition. I believe that to be 100% true. See, if I allow myself to slip, then the doors that are protecting me from that are getting weaker and weaker and weaker, and the devil will use every opportunity he can to exploit that to get by me, to try to take me back to my previous condition, which was one of heading towards death instead of bringing life. Does that make sense, right? So I gotta maintain this fit spiritual condition. The reverse is true though as well. If you allow something sinful in your life to take root and begin to grow and it becomes a strong man in your life, you know how hard it is to overcome that particular habit? Some of you are dealing with that right now. There's things that you've allowed past the doorway that are now deep, that are now strong. That's what this series is about, getting freedom from those things, showing that there is a different way, that Jesus can come because his name, like we said last week, is above every other name. And at at his name, every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, right? Luke 11, 24, as we read on. When the unclean spirit, he was talking about the casting out of demons here. When the unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it passes through waterless places seeking rest and finding none, it says, I'll return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, if it finds the house swept and put in order, then it goes and brings seven other spirits more evil than itself, and they enter and dwell there, and the last state of that person is worse than the first. How many of you have read that verse before? Kind of petrifying if you start to read it, right? So when casting out demons, whether literally 
or figuratively, we're not saying there's a demon under every single thing, so I say literally or figuratively, I think we live in a world where we discount demons too much and sometimes we overdo it too much, right? So when casting out demons, whether literally or figuratively, it is imperative that we fill back up the empty place from which it came. It's imperative that we fill back up the empty place from which it came. Let's go back to my addiction analogy. I, by the grace of God, have been sober for almost 23 years. Thank you, Lord, right? Not fully of my own doing, right? That does not mean there have not been times throughout the years where the devil has tried to come knocking on that door to see if he could come back in. He's come knocking in various different ways where he wants to speak to you and come knock on the door, right? And you're like, okay, what? You know, geez. Thank God every time he's come knocking on that door, I found myself in fit spiritual condition and he was rebuffed and rejected and had to go back, right? He'll even use friends of yours to come up to you in whatever your situation is. Eric, you mean you can't have just one drink? Eric, you mean you've been sober for 22 years, 23 years? You mean to tell me you can't have just one drink? It's not about the drink. It's something a lot deeper, a bigger spiritual condition that'll come into effect that relates back to this verse that we just read. Because if I open the door, instead of saying, get thee behind me, Satan, in Jesus' name, right? If I open the door and allow that one to come in and that verse starts to take effect, then that means that old demon that used to be there causing me to drink will soon find its buddy and say, hey, let's do a little cocaine. Let's go do a little weed. Let's go do this. Let's go do that. And my state will be seven times worse than the first because that's how the devil works. Does that make sense to you? So if you overcome whatever strongholds you have in your life, you need to fill it back up. What do you need to do to fill it back up? by the power and presence of the Holy Spirit and through maintaining a fit spiritual condition. So when the devil comes back knocking on your door through whichever avenue he wants, there is no way for him to get back in because you're already full of the Spirit, which will be our subject for the next two weeks. I'm kind of excited about that. Anybody excited about the power and presence of the Holy Spirit? You can't give them a place to come back to. So do you see, for clarity, one more time, Christians, if you overcome some area of sin, you must reinforce your spiritual doors and walk in the power, presence, and anointing of the Holy Spirit. So I've talked a bit about how the devil works. Let me begin to conclude by talking about how Jesus works, right? So we've said the devil is going to look for every weakness to come and try to exploit it in your life. It could be a high moment in your life where you've achieved a whole bunch and then all of a sudden he'll use that as an opportunity to twist it and put you into danger. He'll look for those low moments. He'll look for those opportunities where you're enticed through the lust of the eyes or something that comes through your ears and you crack open that door. He will come in like a thief in the night and steal your very life. Don't let him. You need to be in fit spiritual condition. Thus, I go back to saying we need to change some of the stuff we're allowing into our lives. May the Lord give us the power to do just that today. Man, I found this set of verses in Revelation that really I think is encapsulated pretty much everything we've learned this year in this series. It starts in Revelation chapter 3, verse 14. And to the angel of the church, the angel over the church in Laodicea, to the angel over the church in Jacksonville, remember our angel message? To the angel of the church over journey, I write these words of the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation, right? You're created and formed to be worshipers in the image of God. This is all stuff we just talked about. I know your works, if you were neither hot nor cold, that you were neither hot nor cold, so because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. We read that a couple weeks ago too, didn't we? Man, I'm so glad I'm in here with the non-lukewarm people up early, hour less sleep. Y'all are here. You're fired up. But we made that case in that previous message that Christianity, you know, demands an all-in moment. It's not something you get have one foot in and one foot out because the second you do, those doors are open and the devil will come in. You got to be all in in your Christian walk and in your Christian life. We even sang about that today says, verse 17, for you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, 
and naked. Is that not what we talked about with the God of Baal and the God of Mammon versus the God that is the one true God, right? That pride rises up. I don't need any help. I don't need anything from anybody. I've got money. I've got whatever I need. I don't have any spiritual condition wrongness. And then they get some correction. These are all, man, I was blown away. This is everything we've been preaching over these past couple weeks. Verse 18, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and the salve to anoint your eyes so that you might be able to see. Those whom I love, I reproof and discipline, so be zealous to repent. You know, be zealous to repent. Did you hear that? That means be quick to repent. Even if you've not overcome it yet, go repent. Lord, help me. I do not want to do this again tomorrow. Go to somebody that you trust, not somebody who will exploit that and say, I need help. Lord, I repent. Will you help me? When you do, you're cracking open the door for the Lord to work in your life. May we be a people who are quick to repent. May we be thankful when discipline comes into our lives. And for the key to today's message, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. So Jesus comes in a very different way than the devil. He doesn't try to pick your locks. He doesn't try to kick the door down. It says that he stands at the door of your heart and knocks. And maybe he's doing that in some of y'all's hearts right now says, will you let me in? Man, I'd love to come in. I'd love to fill with light all those dark places in your life. Have you heard about me? I'm the one who died that you might have life. And I want to, I want to have you be part of my family. I want to come in. I want to hang out with you. I'll never leave you and forsake you. I'm not going to be that friend that's going to stab you in the back. He operates so differently than the devil does. So I ask you, have you ever given him the keys to your life and your heart? And if you have, let him in and let him fill in every single nook and cranny. Because if you do, listen to what happens. To the one who conquers, I will grant with him to sit with me on my throne as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. You believers were created to rule and reign. You were created to lead. You were created to make a difference like good warriors and good soldiers. Stay off the garbage stuff and keep the good stuff coming into your life in Jesus' name. Would you rise with me and bow your heads and close your eyes today? Here's my final verse for today. In that same set of verses in Revelation chapter 3, finishing with verse 22. It says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Father, we bow our heads and close our eyes, and I pray today that your word got through to each of our hearts and minds in a way that would lead to transformative life change if it is needed. Lord, that you would inhabit the praises of your people as we already sang but that we would begin to reevaluate certain areas of our life and begin to look at things in terms of these doorways or gateways that I've been sharing. Are there areas in our life that we're either leaving wide open because of our behaviors or sin, giving demonic powers and principalities the right to enter? We're just allowing them in. We're leaving the door open, saying, come in, steal all our stuff. Or there's areas in which we're being deceived. There is of weakness in our life where the devil can penetrate and break in like that thief who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Or are we doing the right things in our life that would help us, by the power of the Holy Spirit, reinforce those locks and doors and become like Fort Knox spiritually, Lord God? Would we be impenetrable from any attacks from the devil? Would we be in fit spiritual condition, ready to rule and reign, as that scripture said? He who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to us today. Would you give us those spiritual ears of discernment? Lord, I wonder if right now you're not standing at the door of someone's heart and knocking, asking to come in, 
Maybe you're here and you've never made a confession of faith of Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And this very morning, you just feel something tugging in your heart. You hear the Holy Spirit asking you to let him in. If that's you, I would love it if you'd open that door. I'd love it if you let him in and said, Jesus, you are welcome in this place. Come in and change my life. Others of you, you are believers. But as I've been talking, you've realized that there's some doors you've allowed to open in your life that you'd rather see closed once and for all time. You just want them closed, you want them shut, you want them reinforced, you don't wanna go back to old things, you wanna walk in the fact that you are a new creation, but you're struggling. There's nothing wrong. You know what the Bible said just a minute ago? Repent. Say, Lord, help me, I need help. This is more than I can handle on my own. The strong man is powerful and I need the help of Jesus to overcome this in my life. So if you're of either of those two groups and today might be a day that you need to dedicate your life to the Lord or a day that you maybe need to rededicate it and ask for some help by the power of the Holy Spirit, if that's you, I would love to pray for you. I promise not to embarrass you, but I would love to pray for you. If that's you, would you do me a favor and just raise your hand right where you're at right now. You need to surrender your life to Jesus. I see your hand back there. Thank you, Father. I see your hand right there in the middle. Thank you, Jesus. Are there others? Maybe I didn't see you. We'll pause for just a second. Here's what I'm going to do. I promise not to embarrass you, but I would like to join hands with you and pray for you. And here's what's going to happen. Everybody around you would celebrate for a minute. And man, I would love to just pray for you. If you raised your hand, would you come up here to the front for just a moment? I know there was a couple of you. Don't be shy. Come on up here and get your healing. Get your deliverance. Allow the Lord to set you free. Allow the Lord to set you on fire. Reinforce those doors. Hallelujah. Thank you. Come on up. I know there were others. Maybe you were a bit nervous. That's okay. See one of us after the service. I'm fired up for you. Lord, I join hands with this sister right here at the front. And Father, we close doors that need to be closed and we open doors that need to be open. And all of our lives today, just say this with me. Jesus, you are the son of the living God who died on a cross and rose again that we might have life We renounce the sins of this world and put our trust in you. You are our God. You are our King. You are Lord. And from this day forward, I will live my life for you now and into eternity. In Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and amen. God bless you, sister. Pastor Don, and then I'll give you a little bit of resources before you go back. Hey, if you just prayed that prayer for the first time, you are saved with a confession of your mouth and a belief in your heart. Man, if you want to take some next steps, come on up and say hello or stop by our next step station. We'd love to help you jumpstart your spiritual walk. God bless you guys. Have a great week. Come back next week for the power and anointing of the Holy Spirit and how you can walk in it. If you're new, come on up and say hello. I'd love to meet you.